ladies and gentlemen, and pookies of all ages, welcome as Mark Eustace and the Palm Springs Cultural Center present a Victor Victoria Valentine with Academy Award winning nominee, <laughs> Leslie Ann Warren Live! Now, get ready for a truly lovely night and fasten your seatbelts for a very special opening number! Take it away! <laughs>
from our sponsor. The toughest part of my day is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You see, after I get up and fix breakfast and get Christopher off to school, it's off to my job and I'm on the go till after dinner. So it's really important that I do the right things to take care of myself. And one thing I do is take Geritol every day. Geritol? <laughs> make sure you get enough and some very important vitamins. Geritol every day. <laughs> And now, let's give a warm welcome to the circle in our square, the jizz and our jazz hot, the one, the only, Mr. Bruce Bland! Woo! Tonight in Palm Springs. Now I know a drag queen named Gusty Wins. <laughs> she works New York. I was amazed. I tried to find her out here, but she was not in the Palm Springs drag queen directory. <laughs> which you believe, which, which, now I. Uh, oh, welcome to the Camelot. Pardon me. Woo! I'm very old school. This was the, always the Camelot. Oh, it's now called the Palm Springs Cultural Center, which, uh, yes, back in the day was the Cathedral City Boys Club. <laughs> And then a straight ally on the city council moved it uh, uh, to Palm Springs. So it's now the Palm Springs Cultural Center. And I am certainly, I am thrilled to be here uh, because uh, uh, I am a senior gay. <laughs> and I live in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, there is only one facility that caters to all the needs of every senior gay. Palm Springs. <laughs> <laughs> it is an assisted living metropolis. <laughs> there are so many senior gays here that next year you're having your own Hunger Games. <laughs> May the queer always be in your favor. <laughs> I have so many notes because you know we're going to be talking about Leslie, but I mean I, I just I didn't want to forget anything. But I have a couple of announcements before we start. Uh, I just heard on the way over here, the US Navy has finished their investigation of that balloon from China and discovered on the other side, it's just a big advertisement for Shen Yun. <laughs> <laughs> Damn clever, those Chinese. <laughs> also, uh, today, Netflix picked up my next film. I will be doing with Timothy Chalamet. 69 for Brady. <laughs> I know, I can see you'll be there the first day. And the sequel, Everyone, Everywhere, All at Once. <laughs> Some are moving in that version, too. Now, of course, it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Which is a wonderful holiday for many of us, and for some of us, a day of unceasing agony. <laughs> Mark Hoistus calls it Single Awareness Day. <laughs> and you know, I mean, you know over Wally's Desert Turtle, there is a room full of, of couples. He's 90 years old, she's 26. <laughs> and uh, the trophy wife. And you know, she is sitting there with abject horror at the unspeakable things that will happen once they get home. <laughs> so happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> we should all be thinking about. Uh, now, uh, I, I thought, uh, because it is Valentine's Day, and because we are living in an era of, uh, of wokeness, and it's so difficult to do any kind of a joke now, you know, because everybody is just so fucking woke. I mean, do you find? It's just, 
Yeah. yeah. Mm, a low moan goes through the room. <laughs> ah. Is there a nervous titter? Let me see. Hand. Uh, so I just wanted to do a, I wanted to do just a little joke from the vault because I, I uh, because it's a Sophie Tucker joke, and thank you. No, <laughs> oh, you know I. Uh, I used to, I'm so old. I'm an old a senior gay. I used to see her when I was a kid. Her, uh, she would play every casino, and I, we were in Miami. My father was a gambler, and um, uh, Barbara Walters' father had a casino in Miami, and she would play there. And her a opening act was Rowan and Martin. If you can believe that. And she, and she would uh, she would open, and they would close because she would run around during their act and set up a card table in the lobby, and sell copies of her memoir which she would autograph for you, whether you wanted her to or not. <laughs> I will sign your book, God damn it. And, and the rarest book in the world is an unautographed copy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking through the vault, and I found this joke, which, which I bet would never do, but, uh, well, she did it once, but uh, years ago. But it was in the vault, and it was, I saw the joke, and I thought, it's so woke. It is such a woke joke. So I thought I would just... Because it's Valentine's Day, and it's, you know, all of those jokes are about love. Uh, I would do it for you, and it's, I will never forget it. My girlfriend Clementine is always bringing me up, fixing me up with exotic young men. The other day, she called me and said, so you won't believe what I'm standing over this time. Ten minutes later, the doorbell rang. I looked outside, and my front stoop, there was a young man with no arms and no legs. I said to him, what the hell do you think you're going to do? He said, I rang the bell, didn't I? <laughs> it's very woke. It's very body positive. I could, I could sell it to Lizzo. It is <laughs> it's just that good. And it, it just seems to work for Valentine's Day. Now, uh, we are, on this Valentine's Day excursion, what better, who better to be with on Valentine's Day than a princess? <laughs> Woo! Woo! It starts with poopy, it ends with horny. Ready? One, two, three. Poopy! Poopy! Uh, Thank you. You know, when you have a signature, you have a signature. 
<laughs> signature. Now, can you tell us about that tracking shot? First of all, is it, are you hearing me? Yeah. Are you hearing? Yeah, because I mean that's Victor Victoria. Was tracking the, shot. Yeah. That that it, that was an incredible shot, and of course I love the. Lake Edwards touch at the end where the guy not only is shocked, but he falls into the track. Yeah. Just giving you a little button to play off of. Which is well, you know, there are a couple of stories about that, that moment. Go ahead. But, um, We're here. Yeah. <laughs> um, that whole thing on the train was, you know, improvised. I mean, it wasn't meant to be, I wasn't meant to continue yelling and having my uh, yeah. private <laughs> moment of rage. But I just, it seemed so apropos, and right. so, you know, I did it, and when I, when I opened the coat, prior to our shooting that, it was supposed to be uh, topless, and I had a 14-year-old son at the, son at the time, and I kept saying to Julie, oh my God, oh my God, I can't do this, everybody will laugh at him at school, and you know, all of that, and, and I said, what do I do, what do I do, and she said, just keep begging, Blake. <laughs> just begging. She did it too in another. She did it. She, Before but, Victor and, and after, I think it was after Victor. I think it was after, wasn't it? That... Before, after, after. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're getting <laughs> we're getting red blue. <laughs> so I did. I, I begged him pretty much on a daily basis. Please, Blake. Please, do I have to? Do I have to? And I had, you know, I had signed on knowing that that was in the script, you know. Right. But in the very end, he said, "No, you don't have to." And I was, you know, enormously relieved. <laughs> but eventually, it, just as well. I mean. It, it doesn't need it. I know. Well, you know what? I, I would, mean, it I would be know. wrong. Like it, be, it would be wrong. Yeah. Because the joke is is the exposure. Yeah. If you were topless, then they'd be looking at your jokes. Right. You know. Truly. Would, probably that's an old expression we used to use for tits, but. Uh, <laughs> I thought Titch was too unwoke to really <laughs> throw into the conversation. But that then it would be a different joke. Yeah. It would be, oh my God, yeah. look at her, she's topless. This right. is much funnier. Right, right, right. Think, so. And that whole thing of him falling in and me saying, are you all right? Yeah. That was all that improvised. Was all, yeah, right. <laughs> all improvised. You mean you didn't know he was good? Uh, no. I love it. Yeah. Well, Blake, and he, Blake did stuff like that all through the movie. Yeah. There's a scene where I, where I pick up a big vase and I throw it at, at, at um, oh, King's... Thank you. No, yeah. not James Garner. Alex Garris. Thank you. <laughs> They're just here to comment on the show later on. <laughs> anyway, so without my knowing it, yeah. he had filled that vase completely with water. So when I uh, threw it, that whole thing came down on right. me. And, you know, oh, yeah. he's, he's that was him. I mean, yeah, that, did the great. Oscars with him once, and they gave him an honorary I, award. Wasn't that incredible when he came? And he came on a wheelchair, wheelchair and went and then the wheelchair through. lost control and yeah. drove through a Genius. prop wall that he had brought in. Yeah. So nobody knew it was there. We thought that's an interesting. Who uses that flat? And, it, and somebody was too late. To, right, to, right, right. To, you know, He's so there it was. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Now I was in London doing working on another picture, and you, when you were shooting for Victoria, and I you remember were? calling you. Yeah, I was. I was doing a little work on a Superman movie. I was writing a little, a little uh, kind of strategic revisioning. <laughs> and I do that a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor. They, they call me in. They say, you know, make this Superman money, movie funny. Like, well, so I was there, but you were there, and uh, I remember calling you, and uh, you said, uh, you gotta come see this. You won't believe what's going on. You won't believe what he's doing. This is the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. I mean, you were from the moment you started it, you knew that it was just, I mean, and we, you knew that 40 years later we'd be talking about it. Well, yes and no. I mean, yeah. honestly, I was, I was pretty, um, I remember the publicist that I had at the time, Pat Kingsley, you probably know her. The legendary yeah, Pat yeah, Kingsley. Yeah. Yeah. She called and she said, when I was in, you know, in the middle of the shoot, she said, how do you feel about it? And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether what I'm doing is going to work. I don't know if it's, you know, I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, right. I really sort of, it was interesting too because Blake, um, in those days, we had dailies, which are seeing the, 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 the work you've done from the day before on a, uh, you know, it's called dailies, and you go and you see this work. And in those days, they were on the big, huge screen, and Blake would invite, would actually, want everyone to sort of demand <laughs> everyone to 
come to see the dailies, including the painters and the gaffers and the grips, and because he liked to see where the real laughs were. Mm -hmm. So he wanted an audience to watch the dailies, basically. And I remember the first couple of days seeing, seeing the dailies and thinking, oh, I can go a whole lot further with this character. You uh -huh. know, it really gave me the courage right. to go full tilt, boogie. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> had you looked at <laughs> had you looked at a lot of Gene Harlow and Gene Hagen and uh, Carol Lombard and people who did yeah. Kinky Boys, bop, blonde, gun model, bombshell types? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did what I did with my coach, a woman named Norena, um, who was my coach for years and years and years. Um, we did Choose Me together, a whole bunch of stuff. She and I made a, a history for this character because basically the script really, she was simply a showgirl, a chorus girl. And, you know, I thought, oh, she should be blonde and, you know, she should. And then we sort of came up with this idea that she lived in, on the Lower East Side. Uh -huh. That she lived in a family of like 12, so she had to yell all the time. And she had this accent, this right. New York accent. And she didn't want to, she wanted to be a movie star. Mm -hmm. And so she would go to Woolworths, those of you who are <laughs> with the seniors up here. She, she would go to Woolworths. I remember, I remember yeah. Woolworths. And she would sit at the counter and look at the movie magazines. And Jean Harlow was mm -hmm. actually the one she became enamored with, and so I copied her makeup and her, her heart-shaped, you know, um, a beauty mark. Right, and, yeah. But the voice was really just coming out of that idea that she was in this, this house with all these kids and had to, you know, be heard, right. you know? So I didn't copy anyone else's, you know, yeah. so there. So <laughs> Oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. No. No, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, because you know, when, when something's reviewed or talked about, it's often said, well, it's in the mold, the mode, not the mold, the mode of this particular thing. And, uh, and it's, it's always interesting to hear the actors say, well, no. It, it, no. Know. And I also never saw her as, like, dumb blonde. Yeah, right. I thought she was calculating and, and uh -huh. smart, street smart. Right. And, you know, had ulterior motives and, you yeah. know, yeah. so... <laughs> She knew it, and, and she knew what she wanted, clearly, she, yeah. As, yeah. as our opening number expressed. She <laughs> knew what she wanted. Yeah. Well, we're about the same age, so I, I, I told her a minute ago that uh, I mean, I've known her for almost 50 years, but, but uh, um, when I saw her when I was a kid, when she was a kid, but she was working. She was on Broadway, she was a teenager, and she was in a show called 110 in the Shade, uh, where she created a sensation. Uh, if you ever get, if you are looking for an, an old album to listen to from an old broad, an older Broadway show, which is to say from the 60s, it's a, a music called The Rainmaker, and she was like the, the, Inga Swenson was the, uh, the kind of, the, the Catherine Hepburn who was kind of doer, but there was a young firebrand girl in the show to my left, and had a number called Under the Red Hat, which was, Kind of scandalous at the time. I mean, it was it was suggestive and it was suggestive. Yeah, yeah. it was suggestive, and it was fun because I started as a ballet dancer in New York and um, and went into musical theater training when I was about fourteen, fifteen. And <clears throat> excuse me, one of you know, but a dancer. One of my most incredible experiences was the, the first show that I did. The choreographer was a woman named Agnes DeMille. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, who changed the face of musical theater by doing Carousel in Oklahoma and many others, and she was known for <coughs> utilizing dance and moving the story forward as opposed to isolated dance numbers. So that was my first choreographer, which was, you know, an incredible experience for a young dancer. Mm -hmm. She called me Spaghetti Spine. <laughs> <laughs> because I'd never done lifts, you uh -huh. know, I'd never done a lift. And I had to do, you know, where the boy lifts you, and my spine was like, you know, well, I, yeah. I didn't know how to do it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, uh, but that was a hit, and it ran for a year or so. And, uh, Every nine months on Broadway. For nine months on Broadway. Six months then, on the road. Right. And then, of course, there was another show that I went to see you in that didn't last terribly long. 
it was a musical called Drat the Cat, which was about a cat burglar. And the, the two things most remembered about it are the poster, because it was Leslie Rearview in a cat suit yeah. with, uh, over her shoulder with, you know, yeah. with the cat's eyes and all that kind of stuff, which of yeah. course uh, it hung in many dorms for a, a while. <laughs> and many people looked at it late at night after Carson. <laughs> cult following. And, and the, the, the show died, but the songs lived. And that's because they were recorded by Barbara Streisand. Barbara. Yeah. Because Barbara was going with the co-star of the show. Well, she was married to Elliot. She was married to Elliot Gould, Gould, who was the co-star of the show. Yeah. With so, what's the song, He Touched Me? Well, in the show, the yeah. song was, um, he sang, She Touched Me. She Touched Me. Oh, it was really? me, yeah, touching I him. See. Barbara wouldn't sing that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Not too woke. <laughs> but she changed the lyric. She, she, she changed. It. Well, she knows she got a song time to change the lyric. So. Right. She, this was right. practice for Is the later true? days. Well, uh, yeah, he wrote a uh, he wrote a new lyric. I'm putting it together for her wow. when she did the Broadway album. Wow. Yeah. So please, you know. Please. Does I, anyone I, say no? I mean, no. no. It cannot be done. <laughs> but but and then Cinderella happened, right? Well, Cinderella had <laughs> Cinderella happened in the middle of 110 in the Shade. I was ah. I was on the road with 110, um, and I auditioned for. I have a great story about the audition because I was I was 18, and um, the first audition I was so terrified, you know, because of Richard Rogers and. I was just so terrified, and hundreds of young girls were auditioning, and I did a really terrible audition. And yeah. you know, he basically said, you know, thank you, but no thanks. <laughs> and the director uh, of Cinderella, Charles Dubin, had seen me in 110 in the Shade and said, you know, please give her another chance. And this time, I came back to his. It was his apartment on Park Avenue, and. Eugene Loring, who did the choreography, and Johnny Green, who did the musical um, arrangements, um, and Richard Rogers, Mr. Rogers, was there, of course, and and Charles Dubin, the director, and they asked, he asked everyone to leave the, the living room, he had a grand piano, and he asked me to sit down next to him, and he played My Funny Valentine, and had me, he would play a verse, a verse and then he'd have me sing it. And we went through the whole song that way, and I don't know what it was, but I got it. You know, I got the job. And it was interesting, Jack Jones was the first Prince Charming, and he was, a, he was coming from the jazz world. And he would do riffs and kind of put a, put a you know, spin on it, on the music. And Mr. Rogers only wanted you to sing it the way he had written it exactly, which is why when he played My Funny Valentine, he would sing it, play it, and then he'd have me yeah. repeat it. And Jack Jones got fired ha. in rehearsal. Wow. <laughs> and Stuart Damon came in, who was beautiful and a great prince and great partner. Yeah. yeah. Composers are like that at the beginning. I mean, uh, obviously everyone's done My Funny Valentine. He's heard it done every possible right. way. Uh, but uh, when he's doing it, he's going to do it. Well, that's what he wants with his music. He wants yeah. you to do his music the way he wrote it and conceived it. And you better do it that way, or you're gone. <laughs> I, un I understand. Now, um, this television, obviously, that's what many people discovered you from Cinderella mm -hmm. and all that. And then, but then you came out to Hollywood, and uh, you worked with uh, two Walters, Disney yeah. and Brennan. Yeah, two and notable, yeah. Two notable people who were not fond of the Jews, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have I that think, experience. Well, I never had that experience with Never him. had an experience with it. Well, well, the Sherman Brothers. But I, I did his last movie, Walt Disney. He did I, his last one. That was yeah, Happy's Millionaire. Was Happy's yeah. Millionaire, yeah. And he was, that was his last movie, I, uh, yeah. I asked the Sherman Brothers who did work on... It, on all that, of his movies. All of them, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, they're, they're two Jewish guys, and... Uh, I asked him once, how did you get by with, at Disney with Walt Disney? And he said, he didn't know we were Jewish. He said, we never told him about it. Our names were Sherman, and we never took the Jewish holidays off. That's interesting. <laughs> and so that was it. 
But and then with Walter Brennan, it was a quick. That's another story. Now I was looking at this clip uh, with the Happiest Millionaire, Geraldine Page, Greer Garson. I know. And uh, Fred McMurray. Walter Pigeon. I Fred mean, McMurray. these are all no, acting McMurray. legends, Hollywood legends. Yeah. And here you are, probably still a teenager. I was eighteen. Yeah. I was eighteen right. and a half. Yeah. It was incredible. And plus, I was in the actor's studio at the time, which is, uh, I mean, I had just gotten into the actor's studio in New York. And so, Geraldine Page was this iconic actress, right. you know. Well, you were also, I have to point out, you were like the first dancer who they let in, right? Actor's studio? Or no, they didn't let me in because of my dancing. Oh, What's no, I, I with mean, you, they, Bruce? They, no, they, <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. People who were actors who had, you know, no, but you no. would come in as, uh, never mind, okay. <laughs> Tear up those notes. You know, it's no. Wikipedia says I'm a vegan. <laughs> <one>. so, <laughs> I eat. No, I auditioned my, I, I, actually I was in an acting class and the other actor, <clears throat> excuse me, asked me to uh, do the audition with him. And uh -huh. I didn't really even know what the artist studio was. You're right, yeah. And so I did the audition, we did the preliminary and then we did the final and it was a play that was, uh, happening in New York called Oh Dad, Poor Dad. Sure. Yeah. With Barbara Harris. Well, yeah. yeah. Joe Van Fleet. Yeah. Yeah. Mark West's favorite, Joe Van Fleet. Yeah. And, you know, I got in and he didn't. But it had nothing to do with dancing. <laughs> nothing to do with dancing. All right. I just, I, okay, since I've stepped on myself up, Joe Van Fleet, who Mark said, I must ask you about Joe Van Fleet because you work with her. And Joe Van Fleet was a great character actress who uh, got an Oscar for uh, East of Eden. Yeah. And the first Oscar show I wrote, this is apropos of nothing, Alan Carr produced, and we were having a meeting at his pool house with the ABC executives. And he was talking about how he wanted the show to be as glamorous as the ones he had seen as a kid. He said, I remember Joe Van Fleet running down the aisle in this bouffant gown, and it was just so glamorous. And one of the ABC guys said, what was a guy named Joe doing wearing a bouffant <laughs> Ever since then, I thought it's my personal mission to get Joe Van Fleet back in the, in the zeitgeist. So tell me about Joe. Well, she was, you know, she was amazing and an incredible, incredible actress. You know, she just came in with this history of brilliant work, and um, but she was, you know, she was, she was a little bit suited for that role. Yeah, <laughs> this was the happiest millionaire. This was. No, no, oh, no, was, no. Which one was Wait. this? Wait, what was this? This, oh dear. Okay. This was. This was. Cinderella. Oh, and Cinderella. Cinderella. Well, she, played, was, she was a she stepmother. The wicked course, yeah. stepmother, and she was, you know, she was. I let's just say I could not get close to her. <laughs> right. She wasn't really a happy stepmother. She wasn't. She, wasn't she was in character much could, of the so time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. When she yeah. asked you to come rake her dressing room, you decided. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Exactly. No, she she was fabulous, but yeah. not cuddly. Yeah. <laughs> The Geraldine and, and the, this other, I couldn't believe that scene, but all of these That was incredible. In I mean, Geraldine Page, and she was very nervous because she yeah. had to sing, and she'd never sung in a movie, and she never, I don't think, sang think professionally sang. in yeah. any way, so she was, she was kind of, you know, she was nervous, but she was so great, and I mean, Greer Garson played my mother, you know, right. and it was just, <laughs> I mean, what a beautiful woman, and uh, incredible, graceful right. legend, you know. Fabulous. And I loved Fred McMurray who played my dad, and I felt so uh, warm, toward him, him, warm towards him, and he was so protective, and you know, I was so young, I was so young. Yeah, yeah. And they were looking out for you. They, they were. were. They, so they were. They, it wasn't as predatory for you as for some others? On that shoot? Uh, any, anything, I mean, generally. <laughs> that's, oh, that's I see what it was. That's, that's, <laughs> That's an interesting segue. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I just thought, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I think that at that time, especially at that time, and, you know, growing up in the business the way that I did, really, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, it was prevalent. And, you know, you, you never thought to say anything. You know, you never right. considered that you would say anything because it was um, expected of you to... I mean, I never had to do anything really horrible, but people were inappropriate. Yeah. And, you know, um, some of them are gone, so I'm going to be careful what I, you know, what I say, not name names. But, yeah, people were... Um, not people, men were... <laughs> you know, them. 
they, it, it was it was awful, you know. But it wasn't awful all the time. And then there were gems like Fred McMurray and Walt Disney and yeah. Richard Rogers, and I I know that there are all kinds of stories, but so not with me. Yeah. Wow. No. All right. Not with me either. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's something I object to. No, why not? Hashtag why not me? <laughs> no one is ever inappropriate with me. I'm yearning for it, frankly. <laughs> Want to try? I pass. <laughs> well, then I can confess to you that when I first met you, I thought, oh my God. The girl from Pickup on 101. Oh, nobody knows that movie. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you not know that movie? No, it's, they oh, don't know man, that movie. Man, it's a trash classic. It is. It was, but it was Martin Sheen. It was Martin Sheen. Martin exactly. Sheen and um, oh, what was the older actor's name? Um, hmm, I can't remember. But he was a famous kind of guy know, at the time. Yeah, I forget. I mean, I remember, I, you know, it was the kind of thing we all went to see. We would get stoned to go to see. Oh, nice. We had, I, knew, I think, were you part of that briefly? We had a thing called Cinema Chienne. No. Would, no, that wasn't you? What was that? Allie was a part of that. Was Allie she? Rose was a part of it. Uh, it was uh, a thing we did on Saturday nights on Hollywood Boulevard. We'd go see the latest piece of crap. Oh, nice. At Thank the midnight you. show, we'd all get really kind of baked <laughs> and go see a Karen Black and Dudley Moore and Tuesday Weld and Tony oh, Basil. Yes, and uh, um, yeah, I forget who else. There was a whole little group of us that would go to see uh -huh. Allie. It was, Allie Wells was always there. And we would go to see, and, and we finally stopped because we went to see a picture called Killer Fish. <laughs> and Karen was in it. <laughs> and she had to sit there and look at it like this. <laughs> so we decided maybe it's, maybe it's too much. <laughs> and they stopped doing that, you know. I mean, we couldn't do that anymore. But. Anyway, that was how I actually... You were celebrated in my crowd, and of course you you were, you were friendly with Ben Miller, who who I, I hadn't met you yet, and she just carried on, and they went off to Paris for a, for a summer together because they were they bonded. We were we were sharing a dressing room with Tony Awards. That was it. And we just we never met, and we we just immediately you know adored each other. Yeah. And we went back to her apartment that night with Elliot was there, Elliot Gould was there, um, Aaron, her manager Aaron at the time, Aaron yeah, yeah, Aaron Rousseau, and some other people I can't remember. And we sort of stayed up all night and we were, yeah. you know, carrying on and then she said, I have to go to Paris to do some publicity for something. And I, she said, do you want to come? And I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we sort of, you know, we went off to Paris yeah. together. It was kind of crazy. But she's the best. She is. She's, she's, she's and, and remains, remains a huge fan. And we did. Uh, then I finally met you uh, through Joel Silver, who uh, yeah. we were working on the Manhattan Transfer together. And uh, I don't know how how you were involved with him, but you were uh, you had done 79 Park Avenue, mm. which was, if you remember, miniseries. I thought was a big deal miniseries. It was. I mean, it was it, it, it beat the, the, the World Series. Right? Yeah, it, it, it got a high rate of the World Series. Yeah. And would you like to tell it? They, they don't know it. You tell them about it? Oh, it was a Harold Robbins uh, book, taken from a Harold Robbins book, and it was about this, you know, it was, a, it was the beginning of the miniseries time, you know, so it was three nights, and um, this character went from being a young girl to being a prostitute and a madam. <laughs> As one does. It's like choreographer, dancer, choreographer, you know, mogul. <laughs> and she was, she went through, you know, she was in love with two different men and, you know, all this stuff. But it was, um, actually got the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress with that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm very, actually, I'm very proud of it, even. I think it holds up. Proud. It does. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. It was a beautiful. It's but my Joel Silver story, well, do, you, do you know who Joel Silver is? He's a producer, big, huge producer in, in Hollywood. And um, he was, uh, my son was little, and he was working for Peter Bogdanovich, bless his soul, um, as a, you know, just kind of a, a gopher, right. you know? And he, um, he would periodically, I'd ask him if he could pick Christopher up from school if I was working, and he would. Yeah. And then he, 
would sleep in my den, and I would be in my bedroom, and he'd, Christopher would be in his room and he'd sleep in the den. And he would call me from the den phone to my bedroom, and he'd, <laughs> and he'd say to me, I'm going to have something called silver pictures one day. I'm not even kidding. Yeah, he was yeah. such a visionary. He so yeah. knew it. Yeah. And, you know, he, he did. He went on to be this really, really what? successful. He, became a, uh, he was uh, a real kind of nerdy guy from Jersey, mm -hmm. and uh, he worked. Very funny, though. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. He, Smart. He, brilliant. He worked, and we worked on the transfer, and he was very Broadway when, when we were doing the Manhattan Transfer, he wanted to get the rights to Company and Follies and make movies mm. out of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, ma he managed to get them, and he could never get them off the ground. And subsequently, he became a big producer of action pictures, Die Hard, Which is so things not like, like that. Yeah. I mean, really huge. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, la the farthest thing. Probably. But he always had, I mean, he, he worked out his artistic things in other ways. He had Frank Lloyd Wright houses yeah. and, and a lot yeah, of paintings. Yeah. So, but this was, it was such an interesting dichotomy yeah. to do the two things. Yeah. But that, when we met, you, I think it just on 79 Park Avenue, and Joel called one day and said, Leslie wants to do a nightclub act. Oh my God, that's right. That's right, <laughs> that's right. And I don't know, I don't I know why that. exactly. Oh and I'm, I don't want to say this, it, it was the, the Fosse Chicago was happening around then? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, at one point he said, Fosse wants to see her for Chicago, the original, to replace Oh, oh, Gwen, no, he I was, think, no, 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 he was doing, he was doing a music, uh, he was doing a, a dramatic movie about um, uh, all that jazz. Oh, that's right. Which okay. turned into a kind of it Turned musical. into, yeah, right. But it was strictly dramatic, and I right. met him for that, to, uh, to do, uh, to play, you know, Anne Reinking, uh, essentially. That was what it was. At any event, there was something happening right around there where, you, where she wanted to do a nightclub act, and I thought, well, okay. And so we worked on this nightclub act, and it was, it was terrific. It was so ambitious. She opened with a Stevie Wonder song, Sir Duke, that's right. Which is which is a Stevie Wonder song, and it's not an easy Stevie no. Wonder song. It's all, it's a tribute to jazz musicians through the music of Stevie right. Wonder, and she came out, and that was the opening number. And I, I did thought, an Eddie James what? song. Remember, I did an Eddie James. You did an Eddie song. James number. I was out of my mind. <laughs> and she was totally out of my yeah. mind. She's up on stage looking absolutely gorgeous, singing the blues about somebody who left her, and you think, they left her? <laughs> there was, uh, we played Studio One, that was where the, the, big, the big old sort of gay nightclub in uh, yep. West Hollywood, yep. and it never went further than that, no, but because... everybody showed up, Barbara showed up, Yes, Every, she did. They, all Hollywood trooped yeah. in to see this. Yeah. And uh, we thought, well, we've kickstarted her career in Vegas, but no. You went I, got back. An, I got an offer to open for um, Tony Fields. Oh my God. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That's why I didn't go for her. Well, because, you know, her first 10 minutes would have been about you. <laughs> you know, it's been comparing their waistline figures, all of it. It was all of it about you, so I can tell you from experience that this was probably a good pass. <laughs> uh, something else, uh, a favorite thing of mine that you did um, was, uh, well, we were, Drat the Cat was Joe Layton, yeah. who was who a great friend of ours and did a lot of the Bette Midler shows, and a, I did a million different Vegas acts with him, and he had an idea. Uh, Are you going to talk about it? Yes, <laughs> he, was, he decided that uh, Gone with the Wind would be a great musical. <laughs> On stage, with the On horse. On stage. And no one believed him except the Japanese. And so he did it in Tokyo. It was called Scarlet! Exclamation mark. <laughs> Which, of course, you went to Japan and they, all, they were talking, Scarlet! You say Scarlet? Scarlet! Because nobody could pronounce it. And it was, but it was a spectacle. It was gigantic. Totally. With horses and uh, things and Atlanta burned and it was uh, unbelievable. And uh, it was 1976. And it was the bicentennial, and Coca-Cola thought, Coca-Cola's based in Atlanta, and they thought, wouldn't it be great to do the musical of Gone with the Wind in Atlanta for the bicentennial? And so they put this, Joe put this production together. But I wasn't in the one in You weren't Atlanta. in that one. No, 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 I, I, I was lucky enough to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to do Miss Scarlet. Um, Miss Scarlet. Oh, yeah, I was to do Miss Scarlet um, in 
at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion That's right. for two months, and then San Francisco for two months. But honestly, this is a really true story. We had a horse on stage for one of the, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not even kidding. And I'm just down front singing a very soulful ballad. And the audience is laughing uproariously. First it was a tear, like a little bit. And then they just started laughing. And I had no idea what was going on. And I turned around. And the horse, of course, was taking the most giant dump. Yeah. <laughs> it, was just, yeah. it was just, it was, yeah. It, 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 it didn't work then. They did it in London where it actually ran for a while. Did but it? the horse was in. The horse was in, so... On opening night, the horse took a dump, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Noel Coward was in the audience. And Is that he, true? Yes, he was oh a friend of Joe's, and, he, and he, there was a little girl who played little Bonnie Blue Butler, uh -huh. and uh, Noel Coward didn't like her at all. And he called uh, Joe the next day, and he said, there are two things that should be cut, the whole of the second act, and that child is <laughs> through. <laughs> He yeah. called back and said, I've forgotten something. I have a solution to your problem. Take that little girl and shove her up that horse's ass. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, it ran in London. It ran. It's amazing. It was amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yes. And I'll tell you something. The album, Harold Rome, who wrote uh, Fanny and yeah. I Can Get a Free Wholesale and a lot of other shows, Harold Rome wrote a beautiful score for it. It and was a beautiful there score. There are some really, yeah. really beautiful songs yeah. on it. And I, yeah. I played that album kind of. Off and on. Pernell Roberts. The Pernell Roberts from Bonanza was her leading band. Was he regret? I mean, they, they were Brett? gunning, I think. Yeah. Wasn't he Bonanza? Yeah. He, yeah. Oh, Trapper John. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. I remember, I, I remember all that. <laughs> now, of course, the other iconic thing that we saw uh, the reaction tonight was a Clue. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Kind of to the manner born to play that role. I right? loved it. So oh, treat. my God. Yeah. So much fun. So much fun because, I, you know, she's angry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was so fun. I, this cast was so brilliant. And we would drive the director, Jonathan Lynn, completely crazy because we honestly would fall apart laughing at each other's stuff all the time. Yeah. I mean, all the time. He couldn't, it was like many cats, you know. He couldn't, mm -hmm. he, he could not keep us, you know, uh, on point. <laughs> really. No. I mean, it was just, it was well, so... Well, there's people, you know, Tim Curry and there, Mark Mall and I think, and honestly, Madden. there's some of the most incredible comedic actors. Yeah. You know, not comedians, but comedic right. actors. I mean, it's an astounding group of people. And what was it like shooting three different endings? Was that, it was weird. It was weird. <laughs> it was weird, but you know. It doesn't, that usually happens after they've tested the ending, and yeah. they say the ending is, does work. But yeah. That's I was in a, a, I was a glad movie, mine like, was a movie like that. I was <laughs> uh, in the morning after. I was in the morning after with James Bond, and the, they hated the, the, the ending, and the, they they changed the they changed the killer. So it was, yeah. And I got a couple of my scenes got lost because that was no longer part of the plot. And right. I'm, Still pissed at obviously <laughs> my career, <laughs> but you, that was yeah. intentional for the clue. There. Yeah, it was intentional from the. I mean, from the beginning, they were. They were. That was. You know, they. They knew that they were going to do that, and right. We didn't really know who what who, who was going to be in each ending until very close to the final shooting. Right. Which was also fun. I mean, it was. You know. But they never revealed. I mean. They released it with three different endings. Yeah, they did. You go to theater A or yeah. theater B or theater C. Which didn't help. No. <laughs> it, it, it kind of tells the audience the ending is so weak it doesn't matter. It could be any of these things, and it's a mystery, and that doesn't make anybody happy. But you know what's really interesting about Clue is that, honestly, is that it, it you know, it, it, it did fine when it opened. It grew to incredible yeah. cult status. It's just yeah. a huge... I mean, you know, young people come up to me and quote all the lines oh. and know, I mean, anywhere from nine to, you know, 60. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's kind of amazing, you it know? Is, but, you know, that's uh, the internet. And that's true. Uh, first, and even before, home video before, because yeah. people, uh, but, but it's been so long that enough, another generation grew up watching it right. on television. Yeah. I mean, I can right, tell right, you right. As, as somebody who had a, a hand in Hocus Pocus 2, that 30 years later, I mean, we never expected that anybody would be thinking of it. Right. And over the years, it just got bigger and bigger because uh, people who 
had seen it as kids, now we're adults and we're showing it to their kids. Right. And it was a whole other deal. That's but honestly what's happened with Cinderella as well. It's that, like yeah. mothers, you know, grandmothers who showed it to their daughters and now those grown women are showing it to their yeah. little girls and it's it's just beautiful. It's incredible. And you know, they, and they did it because they wanted to do it in color. Yeah. I mean, because the, the Julie Andrews version was black, black and, white and white because it was back in mm -hmm. the day before mm -hmm. color, so it's a, it's, a, it's a story that cries out for color. Yeah. Then that's why uh, there are two Once Upon a Mattresses that Carol did. Right, right. That didn't show it. I know. Don't you love it? <laughs> oh, I want, to, I want to also point out that um, she has a great eye. <laughs> she has a great eye for, for, for other actors. I went to see a movie. Um, I can't remember what it was, but she played Ben Affleck's mother. It's called Going All the Way. Nobody right. saw it. It's right. okay. And I saw it. Nobody saw it, but I saw it. But I'm proud she of was it. in it because I, I see everything that she's in. And I saw I called her and I said, uh, you were lovely in this picture. And she says, That kid is gonna be a gigantic movie star. Yeah, it was like Ben Affleck's I think first movie. Nobody knew Ben, it was his yeah. first picture. First movie. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go. And, yeah. And, yeah, and that happens. And then she'd have played with James Volk, who's not become the biggest That's but, true. Yeah. <laughs> But but uh, but I think he's terrific, and he got he has a bunch of series that yeah, yeah. sort of happen and don't happen. Mm -hmm. But so she's. Uh, she's I love aware. actors. I mean, I lo I actually do. I mean, I think I'd make a great casting director. But oh well. <laughs> I would too, but there's no couch large enough. <laughs> God, I walk right into that. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see that. The very least I could do. <laughs> Who haven't we talked about? Oh well, I know Mark wanted us to talk about Christopher Atkins, a particular favorite of his, <laughs> in a, a, a disco movie. Now yeah. that's a rare, a rare genre. <laughs> I, I was involved in one, and you were involved in this one. <laughs> it was called. Uh, what was it called? It was called um, A Night in Heaven. A Night, a Night in, in Heaven. Heaven. It was a big deal, actually. You went. You, uh, he was on fire. Oh, accurate. Chris. It was very, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was about a woman teacher, a young, well, younger teacher, um, who, uh, whose student is a stripper, but she doesn't know it, a male stripper and um, dancer stripper. And her sister, Deborah Rush, a fantastic actress, um, yeah. takes her to this club, and she's afraid to go, and she's, you know, she's married, and, you know, anyway. A romance ensues, you know, a lustful moment, <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, and her marriage is, you know, there's all this other stuff that happens, you know. But it was, I mean, you know, honestly, I know it sounds so, um, you know, nasty, but it was, it had a lot of heart that movie. I mean, it really yeah. did. It was not just, it was sexy for sure. Yeah. But. Um, I think it also had, you know, um, I will tell you that, <laughs> this is so pathetic, the New, the New York Times said that I did the, had the best orgasm on screen that anybody ever seen. <laughs> The New York Post might say that. The, the New, New York, York Times. Times. The New York Times. Yeah. Because it was a very, it was a sexy scene. But uh, that's you know that's one for the, that's one for the two stuff. Really. Best orgasm, New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to have something on there. So many beloved wife and mother. I mean, really. Exactly. It tops that. New York, I was in a movie. New York Times review was. Uh, uh, this is a movie that wants you to believe Bruce Valanche is not gay. <laughs> and I thought, well, I've made it in some sense. <laughs> but no, I, no, I'd go for the orgasms. What well, was the movie? It's they called Oy Vey, My Son is Gay. <laughs> and I play Lenny Kazan's brother, who's allegedly straight. <laughs> oh my God. Don't even ask. It's, it's, but, but Google and you'll have, you'll have a... It's on YouTube. Oy Vey, My Son is Gay, you'll have a big laugh Google. Oh, God. Really, really. Well, what haven't we touched on that you wanted to... Me? Yeah. 
Yeah, anything oh, you brought in? I, I, does anybody want to hear about anything specific? I actually... Excuse me. What, before we Mark go... Mark question. It, it, it's, okay. James what? Garner first. Uh, James Garner? And okay. Julie Andrews. Yeah. Oh. Well, they are, well, Julie and Blake were incredible. And angels. I mean, absolute angels. Their, they, their way of shooting, you know, shooting is usually 14, 15 hours, you know, a day. Blake did not believe that people could be funny after eight hours because they're tired. And so he would, or we'd come in at eight in the morning, which is very unheard of, get out of makeup by 10 and then shoot till, you know, five or six at the most. And at four o'clock, as we shot in London at Pinewood Studios, the tea trolley would come by and, you know, <laughs> for real, they're so civilized, they're so full of grace and so, generous and loving. James Garner, who is so fantastic, was a little grumpy. <laughs> Just a touch grumpy. But I think it was because, you know, I honestly think that he related to my character. He related to me uh -huh. as my character. Right. He couldn't dis separate, you know, right, me, right. Leslie, from Norma. And Norma was, you know, a bug up his butt all the time, you know, uh -huh. so he would... He kind of had that, you know, yeah. sort of feeling toward me. But he was a doll and such a great actor. And it was a blessed, incredible experience. And, um, you know, memorable for me. And clearly for you, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I wish I, we had something to close on, but it went, you know. I have, to have, your, has a I have a special request. My name oh. is Mark Eustace, and I, I'm the producer of tonight's event. And, um, I don't know, I got really teary-eyed and romantic when you were talking about Richard Rogers and my funny Valentine. And today's Valentine's Day, so it's wondering. Oh, that's right, yeah. If you can just, like, sing a little. Oh. <laughs> really? Really? If you don't want to, I have. Seriously. Can't you just rip open the costume? <laughs> yeah. I'll fall over there. <laughs> if you don't want to, you don't have to. But talk about Valentine's Day and, and love and what that means in your life, talk because well, I know you have. Yeah, I mean, I have an incredible husband that I love. You know, yeah. more than life, and mm -hmm. that's how I feel loved by him. And um, we've been together 34 years. And, yeah, yeah. I'm surrounded by love, and it's, you know, I, I feel so. Aw, oh, thanks. Yeah, I feel so. I get teary myself, but I feel so blessed because I have so much love in my life, and, um, you know, my. Daughter, my I call her my daughter, but she's my daughter-in-law is here with me, and my son is so precious to me, and my friends, and you know. Um, but here's what it meant to me. You know, yesterday Ron said to me, my husband said to me, "Tomorrow's Valentine's Day, you know, right?" And I said, "You're kidding," <laughs> <laughs> because I was so focused on this, I completely forgot. So on him, so we're going to celebrate our Valentine's Day um, on the weekend. And um, yeah, and I feel very loved by you guys, and I really appreciate it.
tradition and, and we'll be in 15 minutes.